Good afternoon, everyone. The Senate Energy Utilities Environment and Climate Committee will come to order. It's March 22nd, 2023 at 12.30 p.m. We're in the Senate building in room 1150. A quorum is present. Welcome, everyone. Uh, we have a full agenda today that we are very anxious to move through as best we can by 2.45 or so. Having said that, we're going to start right in by hearing Senator Mitchell's bill, Senate File 2747. Senator Mitchell. Senator Mitchell, I understand you have an author's amendment. Yes, Mr. Chair, and this is my first stop um, and only stop, as I hope for it to be laid over for inclusion. Um, but I would ask that we move the amendment A8, please. Thank you, Senator Mitchell. Senator Port moves the A5 amendment. Senator Port moves the A5 amendment. Uh, members, any discussion to the A5? Eight. We have some discussion up here, Senator Mitchell. I think we think it's the A5. Hold on. Mr. Chair, members, there, if we're talking about Senate file 2747, the amendment is the A5. Senator Mitchell, the A8 is for Senate file 2295. I pulled out the wrong folder. That's my error. I apologize. Members? I'm positive that we are on the A5 amendment. Any discussion of members or the author to the A5? With that, all members in favor of adopting the A5 amendment to Senate File 2747, please signify by saying aye, aye, all opposed. The amendment is adopted. Senator Mitchell to Senate File 2747 as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So this is for um, interconnection assistance, um, upgrading some of the current um, ways that people connect into the system. So as we look at our carbon-free goals, we have more and more people that are investing in solar, for example, and connecting to the grid, um, especially if there's an area that's had a solar garden, some of the infrastructure isn't meeting the current capacity, and there could be a situation where if you're the next homeowner who wants to connect and the last project just took the last of what is currently the capacity, um, you could be ha handed a large bill that would add to all of that inter interconnection um, instead of kind of a prorated rate, so to speak. So this is just to um, make sure that homeowners and people using solar can keep that interconnection um, at a fairer price and not being just the next one in line who happens to get the big bill. Oh, with that today, I have a couple testifiers, um, and I would love for Isabella Ricker to be first, please. Thank you, Senator Mitchell. Ms. Ricker, welcome back to the committee. Um, please identify, so, identify yourself and present your testimony. For those members of the public that are planning to testify, we're hoping for two minutes or so per testimony, give or take. Ms. Ricker, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Good to be with you. My name is Isabel Ricker. I'm here on behalf of Fresh Energy. Fresh Energy is a 30-year-old nonpartisan nonprofit organization that advances clean energy policy that works for all Minnesotans. I'm excited to be with you to talk about Senator Mitchell's bill to provide funding to assist solar customers with their grid interconnection costs. Fresh Energy has been deeply involved in interconnection issues for the past eight years or more, and we've worked closely with the utilities, customers, solar developers, and state regulators to understand the issues that are emerging with this process. As I'm sure the committee has heard, there are interconnection issues on our transmission system, which are causing long wait times and unpredictable costs for large solar and wind projects. This bill is about essentially the same issue, but on Excel's local distribution grid and preventing homeowners and farmers from putting solar on their homes or land. In order to meet our clean energy goals, we know we have to invest in our grid. We also know that investing in our grid improves reliability and safety. Our Minnesota utilities are, of course, working very hard at this, but interconnection policies are complex and the current process requires that sometimes a homeowner or farmer is being asked to pay for a huge grid upgrade in order to connect their small system. 
This presents a fundamental unfairness. Customers and communities across Minnesota want to and should be able to invest in on-site energy generation to reduce their own electricity usage and advance their climate action plans. This bill helps solve this problem by providing funding for Excel, providing funding for and asking Excel to invest in the hot spots on the grid or the capacity constrained locations which Senator Mitchell described and do so in a way that maximizes public benefits and ensures that customers with on-site projects are able to connect them. It also asks Excel to look at ways to minimize costs using new technology by better managing energy exported from solar, batteries, and other resources, we may be able to reduce the new infrastructure that is needed. These tools will help not only the solar or battery customer themselves, but all Excel customers by allowing our existing infrastructure to be used more efficiently. This bill is probably not the last word you'll hear on interconnection or the grid, but it is an important down payment toward the solution and will help provide much needed relief to customers that are in limbo today. This program will help Minnesotans who want to invest in clean energy do so on their own terms, but also these are investments in our shared grid and our shared energy transition. Thank you so much, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Ricker. Members, before we go to questions, let's get the rest of the testifiers to be heard. Next, I have Mr. Porvinsky and on deck Griffin Dooling. Mr. Porambinski, am I saying that right? Very good. Very uh, welcome good. to the committee. If you could please introduce yourself and present your testimony. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Mark Porambinski, and I'm a resident of Scandia in northern Washington County. Um, my wife and I launched our effort to go solar in February of 2022. We worked with All Energy Solar on a rooftop system of about 18,000 kilowatts, 47 panels. We spent $2,000 to prepare our home for the solar installation, and we're told to expect it in mid-August. When we moved into our home nearly nine years ago, we replaced the electric baseboard heating with a more efficient geothermal system. Then we signed up for Excel's wind source program, but we felt we could do more. On a yearly basis, our solar array would have zeroed out our demand for electricity from the grid. Because our geothermal heat pump runs on electricity, solar would heat and cool our house as well as provide for our basic electric needs. So imagine living through a Minnesota winter like we just had with no net cost for electricity or for heating. Everything was on schedule until we received an email from XL Energy in my inbox on June 14th, which was two and a half months after we signed our contract. Our project was on hold because of a possible capacity issue at our local substation. We were told there were 16 other projects ahead of ours and it could take up to 240 days for Excel to review each one. A subsequent email a month later informed us that there was in fact no capacity. A system impact study paid for by the customer would cost $15,000. If Excel added grid capacity, the cost could be more than a million dollars. And according to cost causation rules, Excel said the customer would have to pay. Well, it's no surprise that nothing has happened since then. We understand that the transition to a clean energy future is not going to be either quick or easy, but we can throw up our hands when we're confronted with a problem like this, or we can try to find a solution. As important as major solar and wind projects are, there must be room for small projects such as ours. My wife and I are grandparents, and we live, want to leave the world a better place for our two granddaughters. We're trying to make our difference on our own property using our own money. It's highly frustrating to be told without warning that you can't, and there's little prospect that anything will change. The bill before you is a start. I'd be thrilled to see committee members support it, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next, we have uh, Griffin Dooling. Mr. Dooling, come forward, please. 
Mr. Dooling, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and present your testimony. Uh, thank you, Chair Friends, uh, Senators. Thank you for having me today. Uh, my name is Griffin Dooling. I am the CEO of Blue Horizon Energy. We are a small, locally owned commercial and industrial solar developer. Uh, we develop a few hundred projects a year, predominantly in the Midwest, but also uh, in other markets across the country. I also serve as the president of the board of directors of MNSEA, the Minnesota Solar Energy Industries Association, which represents 150 uh, different member companies. Uh, all of them uh, employ several thousand Minnesotans and uh, represent several uh, tens of thousands of customers. Uh, interconnection, put simply, is the single most important issue we have encountered as an industry over the last decade. Uh, as, the as the deployment of solar has grown, uh, the grid has become increasingly congested, and we've spent a number of years now trying to implement solutions uh, to expand capacity within the grid. Uh, there's really no uh, dispute that these projects are going to continue to happen. Uh, folks want to do more of them. You just heard from the previous testifier, and there are hundreds and hundreds of Minnesotans like him. We need a plan. We need a solution. And as Isabel said, this is a down payment towards building that solution and building a better future for the grid. Uh, these investments and these programs that will be created as a result of this legislation would help build a roadmap towards a more resilient, more secure you know, grid. And all of that is going to be uh, especially important as we transition and chase towards the 100% carbon-free goals that we've set as a state. The other component I think that's important to note here is that this bill uh, is really targeted towards individuals like the previous testifier, homeowners, small businesses, mid-sized businesses who are looking to deploy solar at their uh, homes or at their facilities. Uh, this is not targeted towards other sectors of, uh, of the solar market, utility scale or community solar, uh, though there are other programs that are working their way through the legislative process targeting those areas. Thank you. Thank you very much for that testimony, Mr. Dooling. Our last witness would be Mr. Evans from Excel Energy. Mr. Evans, if you would please come forward. Mr. Evans, welcome back to the committee. If you could please introduce yourself, and we're looking for a couple minutes, give Thank or take. You. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Rick Evans with Xcel Energy. Uh, the, the the situation that that the previous witnesses have described is exactly right. Uh, the distribution grid, which for those that may not fully understand, is the smaller wires and poles that come out of our substation and go through the neighborhoods and connect to the homes and businesses that we serve, uh, was designed originally as a one-way system. The energy comes out of the substation and goes to those businesses and they use that energy. That's what it was there for. Uh, increasingly, as the testifiers have said, when people start putting generation that is connected at the distribution level, not at the transmission level, but at the distribution level, it creates a challenge for that system. It was not built to have energy coming on uh, that is not being used by, custom by our customers. And this has been particularly uh, a problem since the increase in solar gardens, which put one megawatt of energy on the distribution grid, using very little of it themselves, and then having our grid, our substations, and our feeders deal with that. So we are very happy to have uh, Senator Mitchell present this bill, uh, which starts to address this problem. Uh, we like the priorities in the bill. We like the priorities for rooftop solar. We want to make room for those. So this is very good. There are two things we would like to do differently in the bill and would like to work with Senator Mitchell and the other stakeholders on this. Uh, first of all, we don't believe this should be a state expense or an RDA expense. This should be a utility expense. The distribution grid is our property, it's our responsibility, and we are prepared to step up and improve the distribution grid to take into account this new reality. And when we get to the solar garden bill a little later in the hearing today, uh, we'll be talking about this directly. Uh, the second thing that we'd say is because this is a utility responsibility with utility funds, we think the plan should be filed with the Public Utilities Commission, which is already dealing with our integrated distribution planning. This should be coordinated with that. 
<coughs> excuse me. And uh, so we would ask as we, as we work through this that uh, the funds used for this purpose be utility funds and that the Public Utilities Commission be the forum for putting these plans together and, and moving forward. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank and you my two minutes must be up because I saw that. Thank, thank you. I have the top secret Justin Emmerich stopwatch going here. Um, thank you, Mr. Evans, and thank you also for a little bit of a forward spin on some discussion that we'll be having in this committee later on today. Uh, members, that's all the witnesses we have lined up to testify. Anyone in the audience who wants to testify who did not get on the list? Okay, seeing none, we're going to go to member questions. Uh, members, before you have any questions, if you do, it's our intention to lay this bill over, um, and we would give Senator Mitchell, of course, the last word. All right, seeing no member hands, Senator Mitchell, thank you. No, oh, I'm sorry, Senator Lucero. I missed that. Senator Lucero. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I can very much resonate with the, the comments uh, from the testifier about uh, an infrastructure being designed for one direction down versus up. And the reason being is, is I'm thinking of, of uh, internet bandwidth. And we, I'm, I'm sure most of us are familiar with uh, the download speeds being higher than an upload speed because the infrastructure was designed to push data one direction, not necessarily designed to push the other way. And so uh, when I'm looking at this uh, and in the, the remarks I just heard, uh, having Excel Energy service the area that I represent, I'm, I'm concerned about what that might mean if we're going to have to add capacity for the infrastructure that it wasn't originally designed for and if we're not if you don't want to add that cost onto the state or taxpayers but instead the ratepayers in that area uh, that means that there will be areas of the state that are serviced by some providers that are going to be paying higher rates because that cost is going to have to be borne by those ratepayers again I, it's not a question but it's just an observation that if we're going to have to, to revamp and, and add infrastructure where it presently doesn't exist to allow for that uh, other direction, um, I just it causes me, me concern. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Lucero. Members, other questions or comments before we go to Senator Mitchell? Seeing none. Senator Mitchell, well done. Final comments before we lay the bill over? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, for considering this so much. I think this is important as we go toward clean energy that everyone wants. Um, great for the homeowners and farmers. And, and one issue that didn't even get added here is even if someone is collecting this in a battery in their home, they're still required to be connected. So um, they could still be paying these high fees. So I, I think this is the right step to take. Thank you very much, Senator Mitchell. With that, Senate File 2747 is laid over for possible inclusion. Next up, we have Senate File 2295, also presented by Senator Mitchell. Senator Mitchell. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. This, okay. This so is the one with the amendment. This is the one with the A8. Okay. Um, Senator Zhang offers the A8 amendment. Do you want to describe the amendment briefly, Senator Mitchell, before we add it on? Uh, would council be able to? Absolutely. Please. Mr. Chair, I'm not sure I can say much about this that the testifiers can't say. I can walk through the sections if you like, but I think given your time crunch and the fact that we were working on this language uh, pretty late, you might want to hear from somebody other than me on this. And Mr. Chair, this is our first stop, so um, maybe as a courtesy, and then obviously we'll go into the bill itself with the amendment. Um, always rely on the advice of counsel is my motto. And with that, uh, perhaps Senator Mitchell, what we'll do is we'll allow the testifiers to address the amendment. If we don't think that's enough, we can always supplement that. But with that, Senator Mitchell, um, let's uh, finish Senator Zhang's motion. All in favor of adopting the A8 amendment, say aye. Aye. All opposed. The A8 is adopted, Senator Mitchell, to Senate File 2295 as amended. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a benchmarking bill um, that requires owners of buildings that are greater than 50,000 square feet to document the ben energy's building use um, with benchmarking tools and send that to the Department of Commerce. Um, it's basically just a foundation so that places are able to kind of see where they're at and then help see able areas that they're 
able to grow. Um, it also provides for grants from the general fund for utilities to help develop technology to implement the program and um, some of the other areas that need to be covered in this. Um, I do have testifiers on this, and if we could start with um, Mr. Bull, that would be fabulous. Thank you, Senator Mitchell. I do show Mike Bull uh, top of the list of our testifiers, and then Mr. Joe Dammel on deck. So Mr. Dammel, if you want to come forward, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, Mr. Bull, always a pleasure to welcome you back to the committee. Please introduce yourself and prevent your test prevent your testimony. Prevent. Present your testimony. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't know if fabulous, is, I'm going to be fabulous, but I'll be as brief about that. That's uh, fabulous. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I'm Mike Bull uh, here on behalf of Minnesota Power and appreciate the opportunity to testify in favor of Senator Mitchell's uh, building benchmarking and disclosure bill uh, as amended. As many of you know, I was the policy director for the Center for Energy and Environment for nearly a decade, uh, and I definitely understand the value of building benchmarking policies as foundation uh, for uh, additional um, efficiency programming uh, uh, going forward. What you and I think, you know, what you measure, uh, you can make progress on, and if you don't measure, you can't. However, we had several concerns with the bill as it was introduced, but last week at the direction and leadership of Senator Mitchell and Representative Kraft, the House author, we sat down with efficiency advocates and other utilities to work through those concerns. And as often the case with energy efficiency policy uh, in Minnesota, as Senator Rarick and Senator Dibble know well from their leadership in this area, we were able to work through all of those concerns and came to agreement that has broad uh, support. And that ref agreement is reflected in the DE amendment, which would requ uh, require benchmarking of most of the larger buildings in the state while reducing the cost, complexity, and controversy associated with the bill as it was introduced. It also better integrates uh, building benchmarking with implementation of the Energy Conservation and uh, Optimization Act that was passed uh, in a previous legislature. So these policies can reinforce each other rather than conflict. And we appreciate the leadership and direction of Senator Mitchell on this bill and urge your support for it. And while I'm up here, I'll say also, because Audrey Partridge from Center for Energy wants me to say this, we also support Senator Rarick's <laughs> Senate File 2986, which is later in the agenda, uh, uh, amending the definition of low income for, uh, for ECO. And that's a very important uh, change to that bill as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bull. Uh, Mr. Dammel, am I pronouncing that correctly? That's correct, Senator. Please introduce yourself and present your testimony. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Joe Dammel, and I'm with Fresh Energy. Uh, as you've already heard today, and you'll hear again, Fresh Energy is a 30 year old uh, Minnesota based nonpartisan, nonprofit organization uh, that is working to achieve. Uh, equitable carbon neutral economies and we appreciate the opportunity to testify on Senate file 2295 and I'll just echo uh, the comments of Mr. Bull and that uh, you know we've worked uh, hard with uh, the authors and other stakeholders including utilities and other advocates uh, to get to where we are in this amendment so we support that uh, buildings are one of the largest contributors to greenhouse gas emissions uh, they account for roughly 40 percent of emissions both statewide and across the country in order to address these emissions, understanding where the largest and highest emitting buildings are and how much energy they are using is a critical first step. The goal of Senate File 2295 is to do just that by implementing an energy benchmarking requirement for buildings over 50,000 square feet. Benchmarking is a best practice that compares a building or equipment energy performance to itself, to its peers, and to established standards. Uh, the goal of benchmarking is to uh, identify opportunities for improvement in performance, energy efficiency, safety, and comfort, while establishing a baseline for addressing emissions from this important sector. Senate File 2295 will help property owners reduce energy use and operating costs, and will help Minnesota understand the sources of greenhouse gas emissions uh, and energy bill uh, impacts so that we can reduce them. Now, we thank the many stakeholders who have been engaging on this language and Senator Mitchell for, authorize, or for authorize, authoring this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Demo. I'll show now Peter Isabel um, on the witness list. If you could come forward, Mr. Isabel. Actually, why don't you just stay then? Good afternoon, Mr. Isabel. If you could please introduce yourself and present your testimony. 
Hi, good afternoon, Chair and Committee. Um, my name is Peter Isabel. I'm the Director of Energy for Lifetime. Uh, we're a Minnesota-based health and fitness company. Um, and we have about 20 million square feet of facilities. Most all of them are over the 50,000 square foot uh, benchmarking uh, baseline. Um, I just want to, uh, energy is a difficult one to kind of grasp. It's kind of nerdy. There's a lot of niche things, demand factor, you know, uh, K-dub. There's just a lot of really niche things. So um, I've struggled trying to articulate energy to our organization. So um, I've been advocating for benchmarking as a tool. Most people have tools, toolboxes. So I look at benchmarking as a tool, a tool to be able to help explain uh, to not only our organization, but to others how we're doing. So um, I have here, uh, we did some benchmarking that we were required to do on two facilities here in Minnesota. And I've been trying to articulate to our organization that one of our buildings wasn't running right for three years. Um, I couldn't, I couldn't explain it. There was not an understanding on the other side of the fence to be able to understand what I was trying to say. But I could take this benchmarking report as a tool and say, hey, one of our buildings isn't running right. It uses 59% higher than the average building type of the same type of, for emissions and for energy versus, um, versus our peers. That got the attention of our organization and they, authorized me to proceed with recommissioning and uh, you know looking at redesigning that building so lifetime as an uh, uh, totally supports benchmarking as a tool not only for ourselves for it for all commercial buildings thank you mr. Isabel how many buildings does lifetime have in Minnesota give or take uh, about 30 so you have uh, a lot to gain I mean in a good way absolutely good. Yeah, thank let, you. yeah. Thank you for that, and thanks for your testimony here today. Um, members, that's all the witnesses we have on the witness list. I have a question from Senator Matthews just briefly before we go to Senator Matthews. Anyone in the public who wanted to testify to the bill that has not come forth? Mr. Sulem, did you want to jump up? Senator Matthews, why don't we have uh, Mr. Sulem give his testimony? Mr. Sulem, welcome back to the committee. If you could identify yourself and briefly offer your testimony. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I'm Ken Sulem with the Minnesota Municipal Utilities Association. And I just wanted to note um, there was a drafting change from the A5 to the A8 that we think was unintentional. We've been working with CE on it, and I believe we will have the language corrected before this bill I would move to the floor. But we just want to note that that it remains one little minor area of concern for, for the munis. Thank you for that, Mr. Sulem. Do you want to call council's attention to any specifics, or is that good enough to just flag it? I think that's good enough. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan, for pointing that out. Now we're going to go to Senator Matthews. Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a question for Mr. Bull. Um, is there anything stopping uh, business owners from acquiring these benchmarking tools uh, today and using it privately? Um, you know, we're all in favor of efficiency in all of this. Uh, my Questions and my red flag start popping up when we start talking mandates and reporting to government agencies and where the slippery slope goes from there. So we heard one of the examples sharing how a business is able to do this and implement it and utilize it and self-correct. Are there barriers in place for all businesses of their size or bigger to get these same tools and use them themselves? Thank you, Senator Matthews. Mr. Bo, that's for you. <laughs> Mr. Chair, Senator Matthews, uh, for the most part, a, a, a building owner can do much of this themselves. The important piece is the ease of aggregating the data uh, and making that um, more transparent. And that is where this, the, 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 some of the um, requirements come into the bill that we need to, to for, uh, for a, a building owner like Lifetime, they, are, they could compare against their own buildings, but they wouldn't be able, others wouldn't be able to see how well they are doing uh, relative to their uh, uh, building type. And so there is a, um, there is a benefit for, for, the, for that um, transparency and disclosure. Thank you, Mr. Bill. Senator Matthews. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Does the bill in its current form then have 
does the Department of Commerce have, what's the word I'm looking for, tools in place? Uh, are they going to impose penalties for not meeting certain standards? Is there anything that's going to be going down that road? Mr. Chair, there Mr. is. Mr. Bull? Uh, there are, Senator Matthews, there are civil penalties uh, that are built into the legislation for uh, building owners that um, do not, aren't complying, but those are delayed for uh, a couple of years under the amendment to make, that was one of the provisions we wanted to talk about with uh, advocates, so that uh, there's work through all the bugs first before we start thinking about uh, civil penalties, and those are um, discretionary to the commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Bull. Senator Matthews? Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's what my, uh, that's what I was afraid of, so um, I've stated my piece on that. I, I uh, have serious reservations about the policy, the way we're going to enact this. All right. Thank you, Senator Matthews. We're going to go to Senator Grunhagen. Senator Grunhagen. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I also have some concerns about this bill. You know, I think there'll be a lot of commercial buildings built at 49,500 square feet, to tell you the truth, in the future. And you know, this is the government camel nose under the tent. I can just see this bill, once you have that, once government has this data, then they began to pass mandates and consequences and penalties on it. I, it's just the wrong direction uh, to take. Hey, give some tax credits to incentivize businesses to uh, uh, make their buildings uh, you know, as energy efficient as possible. This micromanagement from this direction is just the wrong direction. And it's, uh, it's going to only cause additional problems. I know we got a tight agenda, so it's not a question. They can respond if they want, but uh, I just assume you pull the bill, to tell you the truth. Thank you, Senator Grunhagen. You cut yourself off there for a second. <laughs> um, why don't we do this? Uh, your point is incentivizing businesses, in which is a for-profit venture. Why don't we give Senator Mitchell uh, the floor on that? And if you want Mr. Bull to comment, that's fine. If you don't, we can move on. Thank you, Senator Grunhagen. Senator Mitchell. So again, um, we are giving money for businesses that need help with the benchmarking itself. And, and this bill is the benchmarking. Um, new business or new buildings that are built, um, you know, we have so much wonderful technology. So they are likely to already be able to be greener. But we're talking about these older buildings that maybe have never had an energy audit and could probably find some really simple ways if they did it um, just by having that baseline where they know where they're at. Thank you, Senator Mitchell. Thank you. Senator Grunhagen, do you want to follow up? Yeah, just, uh, you know, I think uh, I agree with Senator Mitchell. Technology and stuff like that will help these businesses become more efficient. But evidently this bill means that they need big big brother government to be able to do it properly. And unfortunately, that's only going to make things worse in the long run. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Grunhagen. Thank you, Senator Mitchell. I have Senator Port, and then we'll go to Senator Lucero just for members who have questions. It is the intention to lay this bill over, so further conversation can certainly occur. With that, we'll go Senator Port. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I will keep it short because uh, I know we're on time. Senator Mitchell, thank you for bringing this bill. Um, I think as I've been talking to commercial uh, folks who own commercial buildings in my area, uh, to the testifier who spoke, it is very hard to understand whether the building that you own or are leasing is is in the right realm of what you should be having to spend on energy costs and if there are things that you can do to decrease that. So I think the transparency in this bill to allow them to compare themselves to other similar buildings is a really critical piece of helping people who energy is not their forte uh, understand if there are improvements that they can do, if something is wrong that they need to fix. Um, I think the transparency piece of this is really critical and I thank you for bringing the bill. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Port. Senator Lucero. Uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, Mr. Chair, and I'm just a, a question to the Chief author on, on clear, uh, clarification on what data is going to be available to the public. So I do see uh, there are were portions that it gets very granular into what gets collected, but then could you just confirm for me the data disclosure to public aspect of it? 
how many of those details will be made public? Is it going to be the building owner? Is it going to be their contact information? Is it going to be the the data that is the result of the benchmarking? Uh, what all is included on what's publicly available? Thank you, Senator Lucero. Totally legitimate question. Senator Mitchell, do you want that or do you want to have Mr. Bull field that? I, I feel I can answer it, but he can amend if he wants. Um, it would be the the building information, so how well the building itself, it's not the owner information, all that other stuff. It's how the building scored and um, yeah, it's basically their score and how they're doing energy wise. Thank you, Senator Mitchell. Senator Lucero, do you want to follow up? Please, thank you, Mr. Chair. And so the question is, I can I can see a, a value in having this data be be available to the owners of the building, but what's the intent of making even the energy available to the public. Thank you, Senator Lucero. Senator Mitchell. So for me, what I think is interesting, I don't know if anyone else does this, is um, when I get my energy bill, it says, you are here compared to other similar houses in your neighborhood, and you did this versus last year at this time. And I actually look at it, and me being me, I think of, okay, was the weather different, or are the kids now leaving all the lights on? Like, where are we at? And so the value of being able to see another building that is a similar size to yours, maybe similar construction, and how you're doing versus how they're doing, it's, it's just a tool for comparison. I think it's valuable to people to see if they're kind of in the realm, if they're doing great, or maybe if it's room for improvement. Thank you, Senator Mitchell. Senator Lucero, you Thank good? you, Mr. Chair, and I'm, I'm honestly trying to go as fast as I can. So I'll, the last one will just be a comment, not, not a question. But... So in my mind, as I've thought back over the years on different uh, topics, whether it be the, the, the oil pipeline up north, and you know, there's some very polarizing types of topics that, that draw a lot of attention from different groups. And then I think of most recently, I'm not sure, I can't remember offhand what exactly the topic was, uh, but there was the Minneapolis City Council was, uh, they were feeling, some of the council members were feeling threatened because of certain interest groups on a, particular topic. So one of the things that I'm concerned about with this bill, and being that that I, I work to try to make data private and privileged for a living, is the, the publicizing of this data. And so when I combine what we've, we've seen in Minnesota here, an escalation of certain political topics, the publicizing of certain data, it can be skewed, it could potentially be abused by some groups, interest groups, whatever with whatever agenda they might have to go after and and potentially, it might be just words at one point, but it could be boycotts, it could be physical type threats, just who knows where the escalation is gonna go. And again, I'm just pointing to the most recent article we saw regarding the, the Minneapolis City Council. And I just hope that that would be part of the concern, Mr. Chair and, and members, that this is, I'm just really concerned uh, how such public and, and data could be abused by others. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Lucero. Uh, you know, hopefully we're all concerned about safety. That's part of our mandate as well as energy efficiency. Final words, Senator Mitchell, before we lay the bill over. Yes, thank you for considering this. Um, we already have cities around the state, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Bloomington, using this. And it's a great tool to reduce energy costs and greenhouse gas emissions once uh, buildings know how they're doing and they can see how they can do better and work with that information in the future. So I'm excited to be able to have more of these tools as we look for a greener Minnesota. Thank you, Senator Mitchell, and thank you to the testifiers. Thank you, members, for a good discussion with that. Senate file 2295 is laid over for possible inclusion. With that, members, we're going to move to Senate file 2973. This is Senator Zhang's bill. Mr. Vice Chair, while you're setting up there, um, the yes. witness list that we have includes Ken Smith, George Damian, and then Ramsey County Commissioner <coughs> Victoria Reinhart. Senator Zhang. Um, I do show an amendment at the uh, at the counter, A1 amendment. Uh, yes, Chair, and right. I would like to move the A1 amendment. Senator Zhang moves the A1 amendment. Do you want to describe the A1 amendment, Senator Zhang? Yes, it's an update uh, to the appropriation um, and update to the bill itself. Well, even I want <laughs> you to describe the update to the appropriation yes. that gets the 
um, chair's attention and members, the pages are handing out the amendment. So maybe you could tell us the update, Senator Sean. Okay, yes. Um, so the um, appropriation that we have provided is 40 million in fiscal year 2024 uh, from the general fund to the commissioner of natural resources for purposes of section 88, uh, the division of forestry for the commissioner of natural resources. Um, and so 5 million of that is for grants to local units of government responding or actively preparing to respond to emerald ash borer infestation and 35 million is for grants to a Minnesota nonprofit corporation that owns a cogeneration facility that serves St. Paul uh, the St. Paul district mm -hmm. and so um, that is the language in the amendment thank you <clears throat> senator Jean you described it all right members uh, questions to the amendment uh, seeing none all in favor of adopting the a1 author's amendment say aye Aye. All opposed? The amendment is adopted. Senator Zhang, to your bill as amended. Uh, thank you, Chair and members. Uh, as we heard on Monday, uh, Senator Hoffman's uh, wood dehydrator, dehydrator bill on uh, addressing emerald ash borer in this state. Um, I have here this bill, the state's uh, largest biomass fired uh, combined heat and power plant, St. Paul cogeneration, uh, which is currently vulnerable to ceasing uh, operations if funding is not secured. Currently, the facility manages over 250,000 tons of tree waste. Approximately two-thirds of all the tree waste generated in and around the Twin Cities metro region uh, these volumes will continue to rise as our state works to minimize the spread and risks that emerald ash borer threatens. Uh, in the face of this crisis, this tree waste has no other viable outlet and no true alter alternate solution uh, has been currently identified. And so Senate File 2973, is essential to establish a new grant program to maintain St. Paul cogeneration as the solution currently in place. Uh, and with that, I have the testifiers, uh, and you should have in your packet uh, a couple of letters from the uh, City District Energy, from the City of St. Paul, uh, and from uh, Regional Solutions for Tree Waste. Thank you very much, Senator Zhang. Well done. We do have the letters in our packet. Mr. Smith, if you're ready, you can please come forward. And on deck, we'd have George Damien from SEAM. Mr. Smith, great to see you again. If you could good please you. introduce yourself and present your testimony. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, um, Commission, and committee members. Um, Ken Smith, I'm President and CEO of District Energy St. Paul, which is the uh, owner of St. Paul Cogeneration, testifying in favor of Senate File 2973. In 1994, the DNR published a report on the status of wood waste in Minnesota, and it stated, quote, wood waste in urban areas present significant disposal problems, unquote. The Twin Cities Metro, there was limited options to manage tree waste, and it was costly. It was leading to legal dumping and open burning. Action by the legislature in 1994 eventually resulted in the development of a solution for the Metro, and that was St. Paul Code Generation. As you heard, the state's largest biomass combined heat and power plant. That plant was designed to use urban wood waste as its fuel source to generate renewable energy for Excel and heat for downtown St. Paul, including the Capitol Complex. The plant went operational in 2003 and since then has managed 4.7 million tons of wood waste. Unfortunately, the plant is facing closure next year during a time when wood waste from EAB is rapidly increasing. While the policy and economic environment for biomass energy has evolved since then, the need for the plant to manage large volumes of tree waste has not. The data shows that St. Paul Cogen is the most indispensable asset for tree waste management in the metro. The third party study completed for, on EAB waste for Hennepin, Ramsey, and Washington counties last year said that it was managing approximately two thirds of the region's tree waste, and it stated, quote, without St. Paul Cogen's processing capacity is impossible to absorb current material volumes through other offtake channels. Unquote. 
2019 EQB report reported that EAB will produce 1.7 million tons of wood waste in the seven county metro area alone. And it highlighted the importance of this plant. This plant ceases operation. There's no realistic real realistic uh, alternatives in place or in planning to deal with 250,000 tons of tree waste that it uses every year. To give you a sense of scale, it's enough to fill 11,300 semi-loads with wood chips. The potential for this plant to close in 2022 caused the legislature to pass SF Senate File 1047 in 2021 with strong bipartisan support. It had unanimous support in the Senate. And that enabled St. Paul Cogen and XL Energy to enter into a short two-year power purchase agreement that allowed us to continue to operate as we were secure funding to reduce the cost of electricity. That agreement was approved by the PUC, and the expectation is to go back for a longer-term agreement, we would have to reduce the price. That agreement ends next year. Originally, St. Paul Cogen was able to pass all the cost of biomass fuel through, but that ended in 2022. And the revenue we're able to generate from energy sales is no longer covering the cost of doing so. The 2021 legislation limited what can be charged for electricity sold to XL and established expectations for reductions beyond 2024. That limitation plus inflation has made the situation financially unsustainable. Financial projections indicate that $20 a ton is needed to make the economics viable. From discussions with PCA, DNR, MDA, counties, cities, and many other stakeholders, there's widespread agreement that is critical for this facility to continue to operate it. And without it, the volume of tree waste it manages will quickly overrun the capacity of remaining processing options. And then it's expected that the region would have to return to what it did in the past, and that's open burning, producing significant air quality impacts. We are proposing a new grant uh, described in this bill, together with other stakeholders, establish a one-time funds of $35 million that could be used over seven years to keep the plant operating at 250,000 tons a year, $20 a ton. That's approximately $5 million annually. That would preserve the ability to keep it operational, financially viable, and meet the needs of EAB when it's projected to peak in the metro area. Seven years also provides certainty needed to make investments necessary to keep the plant reliable and safe. It's important to note that with St. Paul Cogen operating, approximately 80% of the cost to dispose of 250,000 tons of tree waste annually is covered by selling energy from it. Without it, there's no alternative in place to fill the void that would be left, and we don't know what the cost would be. Action by the legislature was needed in 1994 to address wood waste problems in the metro. It led to the development of St. Paul Cogeneration, and we strongly urge you to support Senate File 2973 now to keep St. Paul Cogeneration operational. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Well done. We'll go to George Damien next, and on deck we would have uh, Commissioner Reinhardt. Mr. Damien, welcome to, back to the committee. If you please introduce yourself and present your testimony. Good afternoon, Chair's friends and members of the committee. For the record, my name is George Damien, and I'm the Director of Government Affairs for Clean Energy Economy Minnesota, or SEAM as we are known. We're an industry-led, nonpartisan, nonprofit organization representing the business voice of clean energy in Minnesota. Today, I am here to testify in support of Senate File 2973, which will grant an ongoing funding to clear, collect, and process the waste from infected emerald ash borer, or EAB, wood waste. Specifically, this bill will allow District Energy's St. Paul Cogeneration Facility to continue processing this waste and turn it into energy. District Energy is already doing this work, and without their continued efforts in this arena, it's unclear what happened to the hundreds of thousands of tons of EAB wood waste produced annually. This proposal is needed to meet the challenge of dealing with our state's EAB waste and putting it to productive use in the form of renewable energy. The main alternative to get rid of this waste is open pit burning, which would be a massive source of greenhouse gas emissions. SEAM urges your support of Senate File 2973 and will be a key part of solving the major problem our state has with disposing of the emerald ore at emerald ash borer waste, while also putting that waste to good use. We thank Senator Zhang for authoring this bill and look forward to continuing to work with all of you and stakeholders to move our state towards a prosperous, clean energy future. Thank you for opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Mr. Damien. Well done. Commissioner Reinhardt. Commissioner, welcome to the committee. Thank you for coming. Full disclosure, a fan of Senator Dibble. Uh, and Cousins? Yes. We, we have to get that out there for the committee yes. <laughs> to operate above board. Um, 23 and me. we found out we were cousins. <laughs> thank you for that. Um, please introduce yourself and present your testimony. 
Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair, friends, members of the committee. I am Victoria Reinhart, Ramsey County Commissioner, and I am also Vice Chair of the Partnership on Waste Energy, and that is a partnership between Hennepin County, Ramsey County, and Washington County. I have, uh, I'm here today to speak strongly in support of Senate File 2973. Um, there was a lot of data that's been presented by the others, so I'm going to skip all of that to uh, give you a little extra time back, but I just want to say that it is so important. This is the cogeneration plant here is the only practical option to manage this waste. In Ramsey County alone, uh, our yard waste sites, um, the wood waste that comes into there is enough to fill a thousand semi trailers each year. Um, and we did come perilously close to losing the cogeneration plant in 2021. And now we are facing that again in 2024 as cited by the other uh, testifiers. Um, we need to have this uh, solution for the long term. Um, and we know that, that we have other things that can be done, but it's we need to have this basically um, to make sure that we can continue while we're looking at other technologies as well. So Senate file. 2973 is the solution we need at this moment. We thank Senator Zhang for bringing this bill forward. The grants to St. Paul Cogeneration and to local governments provided in, for in this bill will help slow the spread of EAB by reducing the cost barrier to remove and responsibly manage affected ash trees. I should point out that at this point there are um, 40, as of this morning, uh, Faribault County was added, 40 counties in Minnesota that have been infested with emerald ash borer, including all seven metro area counties. So, and one of the things that we don't want to see um, is the community's stockpile wood waste or turn to open burning because of the cost to do so, and it's just simply not the right thing environmentally. I think I'm gonna skip the rest of it and just say we strongly encourage passage of Senate File 2973, and thank you for your time and support for this bill. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Thank you for your testimony, and thank you for pointing out it's not just part of Minnesota, but most of the state. With that, um, I believe we have MPCA Assistant Commissioner Kadelka that wanted to come forward and offer some testimony. That's okay with you, Senator Zhang? Sure. Yes. I promise it'll move right along. <laughs> Assistant Commissioner Kadelka, thank you. Welcome to the committee. If you could please introduce yourself and present your testimony. Uh, thank you, Chair and committee members. For the record, my name is Kirk Kadelka. I'm Assistant Commissioner with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency and work on land policy issues. I want to voice our support also for the need for properly disposing of wood waste and the large role that St. Paul Kojo and SPC has in this effort. We have advocated for its continued future at the PUC and elsewhere, and there is an advantage for this facility to keep operating. In fact, we need more capacity than what is currently available. And we appreciate the conversations with the author and SPC and others on this, but we want to make sure one component is added to this conversation that has not been mentioned so far. And we know this is a difficult conversation. There's a large price take here, but we have to put on the table tip fees. We look at this issue through the lens that multiple parties benefit from St. Paul Cogen, so multiple parties should contribute to the solution. There are three large groups of beneficiary, um, those that are benefiting. One is Excel and its customers receiving renewable energy base load, district energy users that receive the power and steam and heat, and then wood waste generators who have an avenue to properly dispose of their wood waste. Only the first two are contributing financially to the solution. There is no tip fees currently being paid to this facility for wood waste generators to bring it there. This is different than any other solid waste that's processed and disposed of similarly, whether it's waste energy or landfilling. Uh, tip fees are a reasonable and credible path forward and should be part of this conversation. Uh, similar, uh, as noted, a $20 per ton tip fee would be still less than other vendors in the metro area, such as the Shakopee, Milwaukee, and Sioux, which is $25 per ton, $54 at SET, and 72 at Gurdens as examples. So while we agree that there needs to be support for this facility, we do want to make sure that given this is a, a large issue, Emerald Ash Borer, that we have all the pieces of the puzzle on the table as we put together a package uh, to move forward. Thank you, Chair and Committee members. Thank you, Assistant Commissioner Kadelka. Any members of the public who wanted to testify who did not get on the list and haven't come forward? Seeing none, we're gonna to go to member questions. Members, uh, it's the intention to lay this bill over. Um, I'll go Senator Weber, then Senator Green, even though I didn't really see who was first. Senator Weber. <laughs> 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was going to ask you what the, your intent was to do with the bill. My question is, <clears throat> since the underlying cause or purpose of the bill is to deal with emerald ash borer infested wood, <clears throat> since the grant goes to the Commissioner of the Department of Natural Resources, why isn't this bill going through environment? Thank you, Senator Weber. I'd be happy to tackle that one myself. Uh, we're having a little discussion up here about which budget this might fall under. It's our intention to present the testimony. Of course, district energy is a generator of energy, and so Understood. that's how it comes here. And in the past, the Energy Committee has had some discussions about uh, cogeneration, including being a part of the deal um, that gave the temporary extension. But since targets are out now, I think we should continue that discussion, and I'll mention it to my friend, Senator Fong Her, the chair of the Senate Environment uh, Committee, but that is a different phone call. Thank you, Senator Weber. To be continued. You're good? No follow-up? Okay. Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That was, that was my first question. The, the next question, after listening to the testifiers, uh, um, and this is to the author, uh, the money that's, that's going out to $40 million does seem like a, a huge amount of money, just as MPCA did say in state. But um, it sounds like from the, from the testifiers, this isn't going to probably even come close to uh, curing this issue. So what percentage of, of, the, of the wood that, uh, that's going to be burned up, or that we need to get rid of, I should say, is this $40 million going to take care of? Do you know that? Thank you, Senator Green. Uh, why don't we start with Senator Jean? Uh, thank you, Chair. I don't have that information on the top of my head, but maybe uh, the cogeneration can answer yeah. Mr. Smith. So, Senator Friends, uh, Senator, or Mr. Chair, Senator Green, the, um, we're handling about two-thirds of the metro area right now. There are projections that it's going to grow to about 500,000 tons uh, coming from Emerald Ash Borer. In I think it's 27, 28. Yeah. It's in the PWE uh, information uh, study that was done. So as as was testified by uh, MPCA, it actually is going to increase the amount of volume that's out there. Right now we're handling it, but the volume is coming in very hot and heavy right now, and it's going to get much worse. Without it, two thirds. Without this facility, two thirds of the wood waste in this area will have to go someplace else. How much is it going to handle overall? Part of it, you know, whatever the challenge that we have is with storage, where material goes so that it can be dealt with. Less material comes in the winter, more material comes in the spring and summer and fall. And so some of this is storage that so you can use it uh, later on. How much are we going to handle overall? A significant part of it. If we go away, none of it. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Senator Green, any follow-up? Any other member comments? Again, our intention is to lay it over and then go... Sorry, Senator Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, Senator Zong, you and I are getting closer all the time. You know that? <laughs> uh, there's two things I like about the bill is uh, that you put in here is the, uh, that I thought I'd comment on, is the every 120 days they have to report back, the nonprofits do, for accountability. I appreciate that. The other thing is you put a cap on the administration by the commissioner for two 2%, which you know is uh, kind of a stickler with me. I appreciate that. The other thing that's missing, I think, what if, you know, government predictions aren't always accurate? You know, we're supposed to have the ice caps melting by 2013 in Florida and New York. We're supposed to be underwater along with California, but uh, parts of California, but that just never happened, <laughs> even though we predicted it. But, um, or maybe it was Igor, Al Gore predicting it. But, uh, you know, I would just like a provision in here that if there's any excess money left over and if the, uh, you know, the infestation ends sooner than what, what were thought, that that money would come back to the general fund. So I'd encourage you just to include a provision in there that uh, it wouldn't just sit with the, uh, with the commissioner, but it would actually come back to the general fund. So just something to think about. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Senator Grunhagen. Uh, Senator Zhang, you do not have to respond to that. Senator Grunhagen maybe get a call from Al Gore here pretty soon. <laughs> um, but again, it is the intention to lay the bill over, and so further discussions about some reversion to the general fund or something like that, or whether Senator Fong or is going to have to have this discussion are for another time. Senator Zhang, any final comments to the bill before we lay it over? Um, yes, as I understood it, um, 
you know, it's a one-time appropriation available until June 30th, 20, uh, 2030 as in line 2.10. And so I think it's uh, money that's spent up front, then, then the appropriation gets sent out. And so uh, hopefully we can have further discussion on that, uh, but thank you. Thank you, Senator Zhang, and thank you, members. More to come on this. With that, um, Senator Zhang, bill, Senate file 2973, as amended, is laid over. And we'll now go to Senator Rarick, Senate file 2987. Senator Rarick, thank you for your patience. Senate file 2987 to your bill, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I do not have a delete all amendment for this one. Um, Mr. Chair, members, this is a simple bill. Um, as uh, ECO has been rolling out, um, there's been um, some abilities to help more people. This bill is simply to expand eligibility uh, for low-income households, and I will hand it over to my testifiers to explain the purpose of the bill. Senator Rarick, setting the standard for getting us to testifiers quickly. Thank you very much. On my list, I have Ms. Partridge, Ms. Fair, and then Ms. Fitzke. Makes no difference to the committee what order we go in. Who wants to go first? I'll go first. Um, chair friends, members of the committee, my name is Audrey Partridge. I'm Director of Policy at Center for Energy and Environment. Thank you for having me today and thank you to Senator Rarick for authoring this important bill. For background, in 2021, you all passed the Energy Conservation and Optimization Act, or ECO, of course, which updated and modernized the conservation improvement program in a number of important ways. Along with those improvements, however, ECO included an updated definition for low-income household that has the effect of restricting eligibility for low-income efficiency programs through ECO. Now, as so many Minnesotans are struggling just to pay for the basics, including their utility bills, now is not the time to restrict or reduce access to low-income efficiency services, which can permanently reduce utility bills for people in need. Senate file 2987 will help expand access to energy efficiency services for low income people by increasing the low income um, eligibility threshold from 60% of the state median income to 80% of the area median income, allowing for more people to qualify for services. This new income eligibility threshold aligns with the low income eligibility threshold within the IRA, which will allow for utilities to leverage additional sources of federal funding. It also aligns with the income requirements for affordable housing programs through HUD, like Section 8. And this is important because in Minnesota, housing can only be affordable if it's also affordable to heat it. Additionally, this bill will allow for determination of eligibility across other income-based assistance programs, which will reduce the administrative burden on low-income families and the duplicative administrative work for efficiency implementers. Importantly, this also will allow the Department of Commerce to categorically qualify anyone who is eligible for the weatherization program or energy assistance for low-income services. This will allow utilities to continue to provide eco funding to weatherization providers, which has been and will continue to be a critically important partnership in delivering comprehensive efficiency services for people in need. This bill really is a win-win. It will expand services for more households in need, allow us to access additional sources of federal funding, and ease the administrative burden on low-income families all of which will then allow our utilities to meet or exceed the new higher low-income spending requirements in ECO so that money intended for low-income households isn't left unspent on the table. Thank you so much for considering this bill. Thank you, Ms. Partridge. Ms. Fair. 
Welcome to the committee. Introduce yourself, present your testimony. Thank you, Chair, Chair friends and members. My name is Catherine Fair. I'm the executive director of the Energy Sense Coalition. The Energy Sense Coalition has a long history of legislative and regulatory advocacy on behalf of low-income utility customers, as well as significant experience working with low-income people to address affordability through designing, administering, and evaluating bill payment and conservation programs. Our combined programs serve over 15,000 households annually. Energy Sense also provides one of Excel Energy's low-income conservation improvement programs in the East Metro area. Several important changes were made in 2021, including an increase in the budget, funds to remove barriers for energy efficiency measures, and, el and the eligibility guidelines were set above 60% of the state median income. At the end of 2022, we had an increase of participation of over 30% over the 2021 program year, serving nearly 600 households with energy savings, saving measures. So defining low income for utility conservation programs to 60% state median income and below, starting in 2024, will unnecessarily restrict access instead of increasing utility efficiency program spending in under-resourced communities. We know renters have additional barriers to participating in, um, in energy efficiency programs, namely the property owner consent to do energy efficiency work on the house, as well as the owners are required to share the cost of the efficiencies with the utilities. While at the same time, renters are three times more likely than homeowners to have a severe housing cost burden, paying over half of their um, income in rent alone. In some communities, over 50% of all households are renters, and those renters are more likely to be low-income and BIPOC customers. So utilities are working to address these barriers in their new triennial conservation plans. If low-income utility conservation program eligibility remains at 60% of the state median income and below, fewer of these cost burden renters would be eligible for, co for conservation services. In fact, there would be low-income renters, including seniors, who are eligible for a Section 8 voucher or other housing assistance targeting very low-income households, yet would be ineligible for energy conserver conservation services in that housing. So the changes proposed in Senate File 2987 to raise the eligibility threshold to 80% of the area median income and allow for eligibility based on participation in other means-tested programs such as SNAP or energy assistance will reduce barriers for low-income and cost burden homeowners and renters to access these important programs. Thank you very much, Ms. Fair. Ms. Fitzke, welcome back to the committee. Please identify yourself and present your testimony. Good afternoon, all. Chair friends, members of the committee, I'm Jamie Fitzke, Director of Government Affairs at Centerpoint Energy. First, I'd like to start by thanking so many of you here for passing ECO in 2021. ECO represented four plus years of stakeholder work in addition to two years of bipartisan legislative work, which I was very proud to be part of that collaborative effort. So utilities are pre preparing to file their first ECO plans, which run for three year increments. Through this planning, it was discovered that a specific definition change to low income was needed. Low income, as defined in ECO, significantly alters current practice and reduces who qualifies and how utilities provide low income programs. This will reduce the ability to offer and provide energy efficiency services to our customers who need them the most. In addition to creating inefficiencies in utility program offerings and administration. What might be more commonly known is utilities participate in large-scale programs that align with federal weatherization assistance programs or uh, income eligibility requirements. For example, in 2021, 70% of Centerpoint Energy's low-income spending went towards the low-income weatherization program. But also, the Department of Commerce can grant utility customer, can grant utility customer qualification flexibility. For instance, last fall, Centerpoint Energy was approved to begin offering low-income SIP programs to customers who already qualified for select means-tested public assistance programs. So this reduces the burden for those seeking assistance 
and creates opportunities for program efficiency, synergies, and partnerships with utilities, community organizations, implementers, and state agencies. Senate File 2987 enables this to continue. Low-income SIP not only benefits participants by lowering their energy bills, it also reduces the amount of bill non-payment and potential bad debt, and helps spread federal funding assistance like LIHEAP further. So in short, changing ECO's low-income definition as proposed in this legislation would provide better outcomes for everyone, including utilities, implementers, but most importantly, our customers. CenterPoint supports Senate File 2987 and thanks Senator Rarick for authoring this bill and thanks the chair for including it in the energy policy omnibus. Thank you, Ms. Fitzke. Um, and before we go to member questions, Senator Rarick, thank you for your work back on ECO. Uh, it was a pleasure working with you. It's a, you're a great choice for chief author here. With that, thank you to the testifiers. Uh, I believe, Senator Port, you have a question or comment? I, I just have a comment. Uh, Senator Rarick, thank you for bringing this bill. Um, matching it to the HUD definition for affordable housing is going to be critical. Um, we know that many, many Minnesotans that qualify for rental assistance through the HUD program, uh, only about one in four actually get that. And so even though they qualify for needing that assistance, they don't receive it. So ensuring that they do receive this energy efficiency help um, and qualify for all of those programs is going to be an important way to help uh, reduce the costs that they have in their households, even if they're not getting all of the help they need. So I, I really appreciate this uh, definition change. Thank you, Senator Port. Um, seeing no other member comments, again, thank you, Senator Rarick. Do you want to have final comments to the bill before we lay it over? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for uh, hearing the bill. and. I don't know if we've moved it yet, but uh, peaked ahead, I'm liking our chances, so. <laughs> <laughs> the policy omnibus bill has all the good legislation in it. Um, and thank you, Senator Rarick, and thank you, testifiers, to be continued. All right, next we're going to have Senator Port, Senate File 2993. Senator Port, thank you. Um, here to present Senate File 2993. We do have an amendment up here. Um, that's the A1 amendment. While members are taking a look, do you want to describe the A1 amendment, Senator Port? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to. Um, it's a delete all amendment. Uh, sorry, Senator Rarick, I'm getting us back on track with the delete alls. Uh, this just gets us in um, the correct language that we need to move the program correctly. Um, I'm happy to describe it in more detail as in my comments, but uh, it's just the author's amendment to get it in the right shape. Members, any discussion or questions to the A1? Seeing none, all in favor of adopting the A1 amendment, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, nay. The A1 is adopted. Senator Port to your bill as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is uh, Senate file uh, 2993, and this is a program modeled off of solar for schools, uh, but essentially in the purpose for electric school buses. Um, we know that cleaner air uh, improves student health. Uh, the, the amount of diesel fumes that kids are breathing when they ride to and from school can have devastating effects on the health of our communities. It's not the only uh, aspect of pollution that they, you know, encounter in their daily lives, but it is a consistent, persistent, and dangerous uh, level of pollution that can lead to to worse outcomes for, for children. Um, so this program is built on the idea of solar for schools, which has demonstrated that there is a real local interest in using cleaner technologies. Uh, in the first round of funding, the Department of Commerce received 122 applications from across the state. So there is a real interest. Um, we had an electric bus program that was funded by the Volkswagen settlement that also proved popular in 2020. Eight electric school buses were awarded to five school districts across the state. Um, this is not a metro only thing. Uh, there are communities all across the state 
who want this technology. Um, in 2022, a billion dollars of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act was awarded nationally as part of the Clean School Bus Program. In that year, Minnesota received only $1.6 million to purchase four school buses. Wisconsin received $25 million for 65 buses. Michigan received $54 million for 138 electric school buses. Um, so we really are falling behind our neighbors in this area, and we can do better for Minnesota kids. So this just sets up a grant program um, through the Department of Commerce for uh, local municipalities, uh, school districts to get school buses, and I do have an expert testifier. Thank you. Well done, Senator Port. Dr. Trujano, welcome to the committee. If you could please introduce yourself and present your testimony. Yeah, thank you, um, Chair Friends and committee members. My name is uh, Dr. Daniel Trujano. I am from Savage, Minnesota. I am a retired family physician and currently uh, a professor at the University of Minnesota and St. Thomas. I volunteer on health and environmental advocacy with MN350, Health Professionals for a Healthy Climate, and the 100% Campaign. As a physician and a teacher, I am proud of Minnesota's rich history in excellence in education and in health. However, we are way behind other states when it comes to pursuing school transportation that will significantly improve children's health and academics. So I urge you to pass SF 2993 to improve children's health and education by accelerating Minnesota's transition to zero emission electric school buses. Every school day, hundreds of thousands of Minnesota K through 12 students are exposed to harmful diesel emissions to and from school. The health impact from these emissions also harms drivers and school employees. It is even worse for students of color and low income students who are already disproportionately exposed to high levels of air pollution. For example, data shows that kids living in North Minneapolis and the Phillips neighborhoods, predominantly BIPOC communities, experience asthma hospitalizations at five times the rate as Minnesotans across the state. Asthma inducing particulate matter levels are up to 15 times higher inside a diesel school bus. There have been large scale randomized studies that have shown that students who are exposed to lower diesel bus emissions had 8% fewer absent school days, better lung function testing, and improved academic test scores. Diesel particulate matter increases the risk of numerous health conditions, including asthma, cancer, cardiovascular disease, and birth anomalies, and converting the US school bus fleet to zero emission buses will eliminate over 5 million tons of harmful carbon emissions every year. So Senator Port said, we lag behind all other Midwest states. And, um, and several states have already passed electric school bus legislation, including New York, which is committed to achieving fully zero emission school buses by 2035 and passed an additional $500 million of state funding for electric school buses. Governor Whitmore, in Michigan uh, just announced that she is including $150 million of electric school bus funding in her 2023 budget proposal. And so I ask uh, for Minnesota children's health and education, I ask uh, you to pass Senator Port's electric school bus bill, SF2993. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Trujano. Members, um, our intention, of course, is to lay this one over for possible inclusion in the finance bill. I have Senator Lucero. Um, the appropriation is blank, blank. If that's the question, that's where it's going to stay for this hearing. Um, so we'll go now to Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And as this bill is being considered for possible inclusion, uh, I won't ask a question to the to the um, the chief author. But I know that I'm not alone in having high concern for the safety, the health of our children. But it doesn't just end there. It's also the children in other places. And what I don't want to have happen is that our interest in trying to uh, keep our children safe, as we just heard with the testifier, comes at the expense of children in other parts of the world where the minerals that make up the batteries and other components are still actively using child slave labor right now. And so again, I just, I'm putting this out there because we need to be cognizant that as we advocate for our children, we don't want to be stepping on the necks and endorsing materials used in these other parts of the world. So thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Thank you, Senator Lucero. Good article in, in the uh, Star Tribune today talking about the sourcing of the lithium and to your point, Senator Lucero, about battery, not just prices, but the safety of those around the world that help produce that. Uh, uh, totally fair topic. I don't know if you want to respond, Senator Port. Okay. Um, I have Senator Grunhagen on the list. Senator Grunhagen. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, just a quick question. Um, I think the original bill had the funding co coming from uh, higher electricity rates. Maybe I, I don't know if I, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I see this amendment. It sounds like the funding for the establishment of the, the account on line 2.23 is going to come out of the general fund. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. Oh, Thank so you, there was Senator Grunhagen. Thank you, Senator Port. Uh, Senator Grunhagen. Uh, yeah. Blank okay. Appropriation General Fund. Yeah, that's funding. a lot. I, I guess I don't mm -hmm. care for it anyway, the bill, but at least we're not going to drive up electricity rates for some of the low income people. So I do appreciate that change. So, and I do have some of the same concerns Senator Lucero just said about where we're getting the, the ingredients for these batteries and the type of slave child labor that they're using and uh, the endangerment of their lives. So as chair friends also mentioned. Thank you, Mr. Thank you for that, Senator Grunig. And again, fair points. Um, before we lay the bill over um, with its blank appropriation, Senator Port, any final comments to the bill? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I will just say that this, uh, it, it both allows for the deployment of buses, like actual money for that, but also for grant writing uh, assistance, technical assistance. What we've heard from a lot of school districts across the state is that they would have applied or have tried to start applying for the federal programs uh, that, that will allow for money for these. And it's simply too time consuming and technical that they don't have the expertise. Um, and really that is what's needed for the school districts and small communities around the state who want to take advantage of the federal program. So um, this allows for both, and I think will be a, a great way to unlock some of that federal money for Minnesota. Thank you, Senator Port. Thank you for making the point about, about the uh, federal money, but also thank you, Dr. Trujano, for the public health aspect of it. And with that, members, Senate file 2993 is laid over for possible inclusion. Um, we're going to switch the order on the agenda. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to come up front and we'll present the policy omnibus bill, Senate file 2542 first and then move uh, at the final item on the agenda to Senate file 2688, um, the Community Solar Garden Bill. With that, I'm going to hand the gavel over to the Vice Chair, Senator Zhang. Right there. Thank you, Senator. Senator Friends, uh, to your bill. Thank you, Senator. Uh, thank you, members. We're here at the end of the first part of the session's work to present the Senate Energy, Utility, Environment, and Climate Committee Policy Omnibus Bill. I want to start by pointing out some things that I hope are important to every member of the committee. Number one, it is bipartisan. Roughly equal number of bills from Republicans and Democrats as chief authors in the Policy Omnibus Bill. Number two, I don't think it's very controversial. I think these are common sense proposals that'll benefit the state of Minnesota, uh, benefit the way we manage energy and benefit our transition going forward. And number three, uh, these are uh, bills that have been vetted that are often themselves bipartisan authorship. And with that, I'm hoping that council will run through the bill in general, Mr. Chair, and then uh, be happy to discuss it or have questions. Thank you, Senator Friends. Uh, council? Mr. Chair, members, um, I'm going to be going through the A4 amendment, which should be in your packet, and I'm going to do it really briefly, but I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, afterwards. Section 1 is from Senator Coleman, Senate File 1003, requiring utilities to provide electricity usage data to customers to facilitate interconnection of a qualifying facility. Section two is Senator Rarick's uh, bill that you just heard, Senate file 2987, modifying the definition of low-income household. 
Section three is from Senator Zhang, Senate file 1834, allowing the PUC to approve projects to modernize transmission and distribution system when in the public interest. And on page two, you'll see section four, which is a chair's initiative. Um, you'll recall that Senate file four, the 100% carbon free energy bill exempted large energy wind conversion systems from certificate of need requirements when they met certain conditions. This section would, would uh, simplify that exemption so that it applies to large energy wind conversion system projects that have had a site permit uh, submitted under the relevant chapters. And then sections five through 13 are from Senator Zhang, Senate file 2166. This is the extraordinary event bonds bill. And that will take you from the bottom of page three through the middle of page 20. Moving on to section 14, this is also from Senator Zhang, Senate file 1834. This raises the threshold for PUC approval for sales or purchases of electric plants from 100,000 to $1 million. Sections 15 through 17 are from Senator Weber, Senate file 2958, expanding the PACE loan program to allow financing of land and water improvements on farmland. On page 23, section 18 is Senator Rasmussen's Senate file 2720, defining hazardous liquid and gas for purposes of the uh, pipeline chapter. Sections 19 through 21 are also from Senator Coleman, Senate file 1003, prohibiting uh, private entity restrictions on the installation of residential rooftop solar. On page 29, you'll see section 22, which is the final section from Senator Zhang's Senate file 1834, extending the law that allows a gas utility to recover gas utility infrastructure costs for another five years. And the final section, Mr. Chair, is uh, section 23. This is Senator Housley's Senate file 898, requiring a report on decommissioned plans for the Allen S. King coal plants. <laughs> All right, thank you, Council. Uh, and I think we will move uh, the A4 amendment. Mr. Uh, Chair, thank you. I'd like to start by moving the A4 amendment. Yes. So Senator Friends moves the A4 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right, motion passes. Uh, Senator Friends. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I'd also like to move the A5. Sorry. I'd also like to move the A5 amendment, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is subject to an agreement that changes the customer number on the securitization bill. All right. Uh, Senator Friends moves the A5 amendment. All those approved say aye. aye. All aye. those opposed? All right. The amendment is adopted. Okay. Senator Friends, to your bill as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, members. Again, asking you to support uh, this to be sent to the floor as the Senate Energy Utility Environment and Climate Policy Omnibus Bill. What I think this represents is the areas of agreement of the members of this committee. We're asking us, is this what we want to have be the policy side? As you know, it'll be our approach this year to have finance and policy separate. This is our bite at the policy apple, and I think it's a good one. I want to thank the various authors of the bills, including Senator Housley, Senator Coleman, Senator Zhang, more than once, Senator Rasmussen, Senator Weber, and Senator Rarick. And I think it reflects some geographic uh, equity too. And by that, I mean the interests of greater Minnesota where I live and the Metro and some of the energy policy ideas. I'm happy to have members inquire about the specific bills. Needless to say, each of these bills has had what I thought was a full hearing here in this committee. And I'm asking for your support, uh, not just because the bills themselves are good, because collectively we can send this to the floor with a bar bipartisan vote. And I think uh, this year's legislature will appreciate it when we're able to do that, not just in the energy jurisdiction, but all across our legislative committee work. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, uh, and with that, we'll open up to questions from members. Going, Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess, uh, could we just get a little uh, explanation of what was being changed um, in your chair provision? Just, it's the one we haven't had a real hearing on, so little, little explanation would be awesome. Yes, you can, Senator Rarick. Senator Friends. 
just one second, Mr. Chair. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm going to refer it in its general sense to Ms. Fitzke, and then I'll give you some details if that sounds good, Senator Rare. Thank All you, right, Mr. Uh, Ms. Fitzke. <laughs> Uh, Chair Zahn, Jean, Senator Rarick. Uh, so what this change did was a conversation between stakeholders. Um, there are some uh, natural gas users who don't uh, pay for the commodity of the natural gas, um, but basically they take on a service that's provided to them from a natural gas entity, for instance, odorization. So some of these large industrial users wanted to be exempt from securitization. Um, we looked at this as a little bit of a belt and sus suspenders um, because if and when securitization would be used, which we're hoping um, would not be used often or lightly, um, that already these industrial users wouldn't fall under uh, securitization, but what this did then is increase the total um, of some of those that would be exempt from it. Did that answer it or should I? I can try to ramble on a little bit more. <laughs> so, if it's not very clear, I'm sorry. Senator Rarick. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess I'm just kind of wondering, we were talking. Yes. So, so, I guess I was wondering about the permitting issue, the oh. from Section four, subdivision eight, where we're making some changes there, was that? Uh, Senator Friends. I'm gonna call a friend. All right, All right. Uh, as we, looks like we have a testifier that could answer that. Enough. Sorry. We changed it to 600,000 customers to Ms. Fitzke's point my, in that matter. My apologies, Madeline, wrong bill. <laughs> I wonder it made so much sense. Sorry. Thank you. Hello, ma'am. Could you please state your name for the record? Hi. My name is Madeline Smarillo. I'm a senior policy associate with Clean Grid Alliance, and we are responsible for this dubious Section 4. Um, so if you recall back when we passed uh, the 100% standard, there was a section in there. I came up here and lobbied for it and said, hello, we're passing an exemption for independent power producers to, to the certificate of need process. Now, the reason that we do this is because um, independent power producers will not build a project unless they have an off-taker secured. So that existence of an off-taker, essentially someone to buy the power, demonstrates need in itself. So by having to do the certificate of need process, they're doing a redundant bureaucratic process that is ultimately not necessary considering that they don't have um, rate payers or uh, there, no reason to build a project um, without someone needing to buy that power. That being said, the exemption that we passed in House File 7, Senate File 4, um, was effectively not an exemption. And that's because it specifically relied on the existence of that off-taker um, being known already. So it basically says, if an independent power producer applies for a permit and they have a secured off-taker, someone to buy that power, then they don't need to do the certificate of need process. But the way that the permitting process works makes it so that oftentimes an IPP, independent power producer, does not know who that off-taker is when they actually um, submit that permit application because they need to develop the permit and ensure that there's some security for someone to actually want to sign a contract to buy the power. And so this exemption does not rely on off-takers. It just says you're exempt if you're an IPP and you apply for a permit. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Uh, so, Senator Rarick. I was just going to say, Senator Friends. Um, expediency, uh, the treatment of the certificate of need, which was really the original intent of the language in the 100% bill, cleaned up here by Ms. Cirillo. Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, poke you a little bit and say how many other things will we be coming back and this is fixing the only because. One. Our, <laughs> Senator Friends. Sorry, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Rarick. Um, I did not catch it in the original language that we passed, and we did not discuss this until really about a week ago. And appreciate the support. All right, and Senator Weber. Thank you. Um, okay, as I think about this, eliminating this uh, certificate of need, uh, you know, as we, we talk about the problems that we're having, for example, with new wind farm developments and, and, and we don't have the transmission and now 
no one has to provide a certificate, get a certificate of need, aren't we going to, and we start building more, aren't we just adding to that particular problem? That's Mr. For the, Chair? That's for the author of the bill. Senator Friends. No, I believe we'll only see it built in this instance where the certificate of need is exempted, where they have an off taker. In other words, where it's already set to go. Um, this, this is not our attempt to address the interconnectivity issue. Senator Brock. And I understand that, uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, however, uh, what we're seeing is that new properties, new projects are developed because there is a buyer for the energy. But as a result, then they ref they're not buying from the existing plants. So all we're doing is trading the production at that point. I hear you, Senator. Sorry, Mr. Chair. Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Wilberg. Here, this provision only re refers to the independent power producers. So that is a category that I know um, is part of your concern, the larger concern about interconnectivity. But we intended in the 100% bill to say, all right, if it's an independent power producer, you don't need to go through this particular process. And this language is our attempt to make it actually say what it was supposed to say the first time. I don't know if Ms. Murillo has anything to add to that. But if she does, this would be a great time. <laughs> Ms. Murillo. Yes, thank you. Um, so I just want to add, again, it's only for independent power producers. And those, those um, entities don't necessarily always sell to a utility. Maybe they're selling to an industrial facility or a crypto mining center that requires copious amounts of power that we don't have and can't take away from ratepayers. So these are situations where um, it's not just your typical utility that's applying um, for a project. It, it would be if they were purchasing it. And if they are going to purchase it, they have a need for it in some capacity. So um, I also just want to highlight the fact that this has received no opposition from any of the stakeholders we've worked with. We've spoken with labor, utilities, NGOs, and developers all alike, and they all understand that this just makes sense. It's really just cutting down some red tape. And we tried to do it earlier, but as I said, the, the language we got wasn't exactly effective. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Robert. All right, thank you. Any other questions from members, comments? Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, members. Again, looking forward to having this come to the floor, hopefully with us able to say this received bipartisan support in the Energy Committee as part of the Energy Omnibus. And thank you very much to the authors of this uh, omnibus bill, including Senator Dames, my neighbor down in southern Minnesota, and Senator Putnam. And once again, to all the authors, both Republican and Democrat, who contributed bills to this omnibus bill. With that, Mr. Chair, I would ask that it be uh, sent to the floor of the Minnesota Senate. All right, and then with that, to the general orders as amended, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Your motion, Pat? Cool. All right, to your next bill, Senator Friends. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, this bill is going to take some discussion. As members are aware, the Community Solar Garden Program in Minnesota is an attempt to have uh, distributive energy around the state to allow Minnesotans to buy in to solar energy and to provide a marketplace where the cost of that energy can continue to benefit from innovation and from the additional uh, invention, invention and innovation. The bill in front of you, Senate File 2688, is a major um, attempt to revise that program and it has been subject to significant stakeholder input among the highlights um, that it removes the requirement for contiguous counties, it caps the amount of community access solar, establishes a list of approved non-residential subscribers, requires at least 25% of the subscribers to be from low income residential. One of our challenges has been that the original conception envisioned more individual residences, um, and this, this bill would be an attempt to remake that. And then um, really to the heart of the, I guess you would call it an attempt to reinvent it, is say that this program's been a success up till now, let's pivot and do something even better. And that includes price, Mr. Chair and members. Um, we're gonna talk, I think, through some of these testifiers about the value of solar, and about an agreement that we're hoping to, to take place to not only allow the benefits of community solar to continue and to grow, uh, but to address some of the pricing issues which consumers are equally concerned about alongside clean energy and reliability. And with that, Mr. Chair, I know you have quite a few testifiers on the list. Love to hear from them. 
Uh, looks like you also have an A1 amendment. I was just going to say, Mr. Chair, I'd like to offer the A1 amendment. Senator Friends offers the A1 amendment. Yeah, would you like to talk a bit more about the A1 amendment? No, nope. Senator Friends. All right, uh, Senator Friends moves the A1 amendment. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? The A1 amendment is adopted. Uh, Senator Friends, your bill as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And again, I'd like to begin with the testifier All list, right. which I believe is in front of you. For uh, members coming to testify, can I have uh, Mr. Rick Evans, Mr. Logan O'Grady step up to the table? Uh, as time is running short, I ask that members, uh, testifiers, keep it to two minutes or less. Two seconds. And you may begin, Mr. Evans. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I'm Rick Evans with XL Energy, uh, here to express uh, support for uh, Senate File 2688 as amended and uh, looking forward to continuing to work with stakeholders uh, and Senator Frentz. Uh, as this bill moves forward. Uh, d very briefly, I can tell you that, that there have been three um, nagging problems with the community solar garden program that exists today. Uh, one, it is a very high cost, which is passed through directly to our customers. Uh, the second is that uh, the allocation of costs and benefits has been inequitable among our customers. And uh, third, that as we discussed in the bill that we heard, I think, at the start of this uh, meeting, uh, it has placed some considerable uh, burdens on the distribution grid, which we are struggling with in certain parts of the of the state, uh, uh, certain parts of our service territory, and and run the risk that that would spread to new areas, based on the removal of contiguous county requirement and others. Uh, the Senate bill, as amended, addresses all of those. It uh, lowers the cost by moving uh, many of the projects to a bid. Uh, situation rather than the value of solar, so we expect to see some savings there. It increases the size of the garden, so we expect to see economies of scale there, which will save our customers' costs. We think it's more equitable uh, because the DG solar uh, standard that's produced in this bill would be energy used by all of our customers and fa paid for by all of our customers on an equal basis, which is sort of fundamental privilege, uh, uh, principle of utilities. Uh, also, it, there is a targeted low-income program, which has been uh, much needed in this, in this space. Um, and finally, uh, in addition to the bill we heard at the start of the, of the meeting today, uh, this moves the distribution planning into the Public Utilities Commission through the integrated distribution planning process and allows utilities, uh, requires utilities to account for this expansion of distributed generation across our system. Uh, and also opens up more territory for the development of these projects, which will also relieve some of that burden. Uh, we think this provides a sustainable business for the developers who want to develop this relatively small distribution connected uh, generation. And uh, so very much endorse the bill and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, Mr. O'Grady. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members. For the record, my name is Logan O'Grady. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Solar and Energy Industries Association. Just as a reminder, sure. Mencia has over 140 member companies who employ 5,000 Minnesotans throughout the state of Minnesota in solar and energy storage industries. I want to start by saying that I'm really excited about this bill because for a decade, Mencia has been working to tap an untapped market within the solar industry. It's this one to 10 megawatt space that we call the DG tariff in the industry. That's a great opportunity for our member companies to expand and grow their businesses here in Minnesota rather than other markets. I know we're working to refine terms with Senator uh, Frentz and his staff, but I just want to say that I am appreciative for his vision uh, for building out this market. That being said, I do have to say there are some concerns with the bill. Lines 5.4 through 5.8 in particularly eliminates the existing community solar garden program that we know as we know it. And for those who don't know, our community solar garden program was established in 2013 and in nearly every measure has been a success. It was number one in the country until last year when we were surpassed by New York. And I think any time that Minnesota is competing with states like New York, we should be proud of that. Of Minnesota's over 1,700 megawatts of solar within XL, 860 are from the Community Solar Garden Program. So the Community Solar Garden Program is a vital component of cleaning up our grid. 
Over 28,000 Minnesotans are subscribed to a community solar garden program, and of those, over 24,000, or 86%, are residential subscribers. That being said, we do recognize that there are changes needed to the program and improvements to be made, and the industry for five years has always been open to reaching consensus on those changes that are needed, such as reaching residential subscribers, reaching more low-income subscribers in underserved communities, addressing cost concerns, ensuring jobs created by the CSG program are family sustaining and union supporting, and create, establishing more certainty for our utility partners. We have brought compromises for every single one of those issues over the last five years, and we will continue to do that as we work on this bill and work with Senator Friends. I just want to conclude that um, the other day I was talking with some other advocacy friends and we were talking about how a lot of Minnesotans don't pay attention to what goes on here. I have a four, 140 member companies that do, in part because we send them the link to this committee every week to watch, but also because they are relying on us to come up with solutions for them that they can stay here in Minnesota and do business, hire Minnesotans here. Uh, this bill in this way closes operations for a lot of those businesses. So again, we want to work to find a way for those businesses to stay here, grow here, and again, Senator Friends, I appreciate uh, the work on this together. All right, thank you. Next we have uh, Ellen Kleckner from Clean Electricity and Timothy Denherder Thomas. Could you both step up? <laughs> Mr. Glenn no, uh, Thank you, Mr. Glechner. Chair. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Alan Gleckner, and I'm here on behalf of Fresh Energy, who you've heard from earlier today a couple times. Uh, Fresh Energy has a long history with the Community Solar Program for Excel, and we were very involved in crafting this policy and program 10 years ago. Over those 10 years, this program has developed a significant amount of solar and brought billions of dollars of investment to Minnesota. A decade later, we think it's the time is right to reassess this program and the role of the policy in the broader solar market. With an eye toward how it can continue to grow cost effectively and continue bringing value to Minnesota for the next 10 years. When the existing community solar program was signed into law, there was a grand total of 14 megawatts of solar installed in Minnesota statewide. Today we have well over 1,000 megawatts with plans in place to go way past that. The market has fundamentally changed since 2013. Public policy designed to support an aspirational emerging industry should inherently look different than policies designed for an existing industry that is mature and thriving. Senate file 2688, as amended, starts this important conversation about how best to continue supporting a vibrant solar industry in Minnesota. And as this bill moves forward, we look forward to working with stakeholders and legislators from both bodies to advance equity outcomes while addressing concerns with existing program cost, distribution system impacts, and predictability. We especially appreciate the inclusion of a distributed solar energy standard as one option for ensuring we deploy the important tool of larger distribution connected solar projects on our way to 100% fully carbon free system in a manner that incorporates our resource planning process and allows for competitive procurement. Moreover, we really appreciate all the thoughtful work and engagement on this complex issue area from Senator Frentz and his staff and are excited to continue working on this as it moves through the process. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Denherder Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Timothy Denherder Thomas. I'm general manager of Cooperative Energy Futures. We are a member-owned cooperative association with about 1,000 member owners across the state. And we develop and operate community solar that is focused on residents, focused on low-income households, and really uh, focused on making sure that energy ownership is in the hands of ordinary Minnesotans. Uh, our projects are over 80% residential. Uh, we had the U of M do an analysis on our projects and they came up with between 38 and 51% low and moderate income subscribers. Uh, and we've been recognized by the US Department of Energy as a grand prize winner of the Sunny Awards for equitable community solar. Uh, we've done projects on rooftops, uh, parking ramps in rural communities, uh, worked with a wide variety of communities to make these types of projects go forward. Um, just a, a brief overview that uh, the program started with an era uh, where the bill credit was a lot higher. It was diversified by uh, residential versus commercial rate pairs. In 2017, that changed to the value of solar, which was designed to avoid cost shifts uh, by the Department of Commerce um, and uh, stated by Excel executives at the time as the right way to compensate solar. The problem was that it really created an inequity for uh, renters and low-income households who can't do solar themselves, getting a much lower compensation rate than, for example, a homeowner who can put solar on their own roof. Uh, 
Uh, the A1 language is a uh, really exciting uh, step in the right direction in terms of uh, advancing equity and access, and uh, it shares a lot of elements with the Community Access Bill, Senate File 2510, uh, authored by Senator Zhang and supported for many years by Senator Rarick. Uh, I did want to highlight just a couple of issues um, that we have with the current language for the committee to consider. Uh, one is around the issue of scale. The uh, 10 megawatts suggested is... Uh, as we see it, really only enough to support and sustain uh, one, possibly two entities doing this type of work across the state. We would love to be one of those entities, uh, but we think that to really have a robust and sustainable industry, we need to make a, a diversified opportunity for Minnesotans and communities for, of a wide variety of types uh, to develop these types of projects. Uh, similarly, the limitation on ownership, uh, we very much support uh, control and uh, governance of these types of projects by cooperatives, nonprofits, uh, community-based groups. Uh, there are some technical issues around how ownership is structured around the financing uh, of these projects that we think is important for the, for the committee to consider. And finally, I will just identify that um, we're very excited about the interest in community institutions as subscribers. Uh, as an entity that really tries to seek uh, projects located in communities and partnering, for example, with rooftops or parking, uh, parking owners to support community solar, we think it's important that we be able to offer uh, subscriptions to those types of entities uh, as well as small businesses in the community. And so we would suggest as a possibility uh, something similar to, to no more than one large subscriber in these projects, up to 40% of capacity, and other non-residential subscribers must be either the types already listed in this amendment uh, or small non-residential subscribers with subscriptions under 20 kilowatts. Uh, we really appreciate Senator Friends and the committee for their work, and we look forward to working together to demonstrating what an equitable solar industry can look like in Minnesota. Thank you. All right, thank you. Can I have uh, Kevin Pranis and Natividad Seafeld come up to the table? Mr. Pranis, well, thanks, pal. Mr. Pranis, you may begin. Uh, thank you, Chair Zhang, uh, committee members, uh, Kevin Pranis, uh, here on behalf of Layuna, Minnesota, and North Dakota, and our uh, 29,000 members and family members. And I want to thank Senator Frentz and committee staff for what is a remarkably smart and thoughtful proposal. Uh, honestly, I don't know if anyone believed we could be here today with a plan to move forward with community solar that could actually simultaneously reduce costs for Excel customers while improving job quality for workers, right, and, and, and tremendous other benefits. We see this as a proposal that really is community solar for all, putting workers and customers first. Uh, now, our ask of the Energy Committee since passage of the 100% bill has been to ensure that we only pass legislation that helps rather than hinders meeting the goals. And we believe this CSG proposal does that. It's a huge step forward uh, in this regard. Reducing costs for Excel customers begins with introducing competition to the distribution grid solar market, just like we do with utility scale solar. Today, utility scale developers, represented by Ms. Smarillo, who spoke earlier, must compete for Excel's business. Uh, and whereas in the CSG program, developers receive a fixed and we think inflated rate for energy. That's worked out well for some investors, including one investment fund that reported to us that they had earned high double digit returns investing in what they like to call early community solar. But not so good for customers uh, if you compare that to the Excel's rate, which is about 9.5%. Second, the bill will write substantial inequities in the current program that have been mentioned, which allows corporations and affluent homeowners to buy solar energy at special rates that we subsidize our members and other cell customers. Third, the bill sets labor standards to help ensure that just like investments in utility scale generation, distribution scale investments create family supporting jobs for local workers. There are a lot of great developers out there and some not so great developers, uh, some that create prevailing wage jobs for local workers and others that rely on out-of-state workforce or in some cases have used contractors that engage in wage theft. All of those things can be fixed, we believe, under this bill. Fourth, the bill provides a measure of transparency and accountability that we don't have today. When a project goes through regular orders, when it's being purchased, the energy is purchased by Excel, there's transparency at the Public Utilities Commission. Regulators can ask, they can check on the projects, they can make sure that the deal is what it's supposed to be. Uh, if there are problems, we can follow up. That could all be true if we move forward with this proposal. 
Minnesota's Community Solar Garden Program has been wildly successful experiment in deploying solar generation on the distribution grid. Now it's time to take the next step and make that available to everyone. We can't rely on a subscription model. We should make all of the benefits of community solar equally available to customers, and the cost should be shared equally among customers. Thank you for your time. Ms. Seafeld, is she here? Um, we'll go next to our testifiers, Annie Levinson Falk and Whitney Terrell. Could you both come up to the table, please? Ms. Levinson Falk, you can begin your testimony. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Annie Levinson Falk, Executive Director of the Citizens Utility Board of Minnesota, a nonprofit advocate for Minnesota utility customers. Um, CUB looks at this bill and the community solar program in general from the perspective of its effects on consumers, both those who choose to participate and those who do not participate. Um, you know, as has been discussed, there's no question that the community solar garden program has been very successful in spurring local solar generation and a local solar industry here. Um, and there's no question that Minnesota should have distributed solar. We, CUB has modeling that shows that it, distributed solar is a substantial piece of the lowest cost pathway to decarbonization. Um, and you know, like something like 28,000 customers have subscribed to the, to the program and there's more people who would, who would do so given the opportunity so that we know that there's, there's a substantial amount of, of interest and a lot of folks that like having that option. However, CUB shares um, the concerns that you've heard expressed by others um, regarding the community solar program. The energy from the program is quite expensive, um, and that's having an impact on ratepayers. Um, and we share the equity concerns. Residential customers are a relatively small portion of the total energy um, in the program, and less than 1% of subscribers um, are, are qualify as low income that receive energy assistance. Um, but as was mentioned, all customers pay for it through their bills. We also think there's probably improvements that could be made from a consumer protection standpoint, such as some more transparency into what the contract terms look like. Um, now that the program has been in operation for 10 years, and especially since the 100% law now makes it certain that there's going to be a large amount of solar growth in the next uh, 17 years, we agree that this is a good time to evaluate how the program has been working and um, rethink a little bit what its goals should be kind of in the next generation. I want to say thank you to Chair Frentz uh, and his staff for their dedication to digging into this really complex topic and trying to find a way forward that addresses some of the issues we've seen. Um, and also takes advantage of the benefits of distributed solar as part of the energy mix. Um, in particular, CUB appreciates that this bill incorporates a competitive acquisition process to drive down costs and also to allow um, the savings from federal solar incentives that are in place now to be passed on to ratepayers. Um, we also appreciate that distributed energy resources are being tied to utilities integrated resource planning processes so that um, that can be kind of thought out in the details of the PUC. Um, we know that some parties have concerns that this is going to be an ongoing conversation um, with stakeholders and probably with the House between now and the end of session and commit to continuing to engage with Chair France and other stakeholders if we might be of help. Thank you. Ms. Terrell, please Chair. state your name and you can begin your pro uh, testimony. Thank you. My name is Whitney Terrell and I'm here as a resident of Hopkins, Minnesota. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Um, I'm happy to share my post personal testimony as a um, community solar subscriber and also what it means specifically as someone coming from Hopkins. My family and I were delighted to purchase a condo in Hopkins and to move there um, with um, both the convenience and challenges of living in a multifamily building. One of the things that became challenging for us is how we would get access to clean energy, knowing that we're, um, we would have to work through the challenges of a homeowner's association. So when I found out that there's the opportunity to describe to an array that's located on North High School, which has personal significance to me and my family, um, and also I thought would be a cool way for me to talk about it with my own community and community and family members, um, I subscribed. I'm still waiting for those benefits to go online, but I am a subscriber. <laughs> so that's a whole different topic. But the opportunity um, to subscribe to clean energy for my family is something that really helped meet the imagination I have for how my family gets its energy. Um, one of the things that um, I'm hopeful for is that um, there, there won't be a cap, that my family and I will have the opportunity in the future if we do move to a home or move up in our, um, hopefully still staying in Hopkins, um, that there won't be a limit in our options to subscribe whether we have a solar arrays on our home or um, are able to put them on our building. We, 
it would be great to make sure that um, within the four square miles of Hopkins that all 20,000 people who live there would have the option to subscribe whether or not they wanted to put um, solar on their homes or not. I found that in my subscription process, I was able to pay, but I also had the option to pay for others if they wanted to, or um, people could subscribe based on their income. So I found that was very equitable. This is meaningful, for example, in a community like Hopkins, and I'm not here to talk on behalf of the city, um, but of the people who do rent in Hopkins, 95% um, uh, of BIPOC residents in Hopkins are renters. And so that means about 7,000 people. Um, so there's an equity component is what I'm trying to say for people who live in multifamily housing. And I'd love to see this expanded without a cap. Um, and that also I'm, I'm really looking forward to um, meeting uh, my solar neighbors um, who are subscribing to the North High Solar Array and that there's ongoing economic savings and clean energy for all Minnesotans. Thank you for the wonderful testimony, Ms. Terrell. Um, we will go on to our last two testifiers, uh, Charles, oh, no, three, Charles uh, Sutton and Reed Richardson. And we have one more testifier that will testify remotely. Uh, Chair Zhang, uh, members of the committee, my name is Charles Sutton, and I'm here on behalf of the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 49, and the North Central States Regional Council of Carpenters. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today. I would like to thank Senator Frentz for bringing this bill forward, which, as amended by the DE, takes important steps to improve the way distributed generation solar projects are regulated in the state. Uh, both of the unions I represent support solar energy. We regularly advocate in front of the PUC and at public meetings across the state for solar projects. Uh, Utility-scale solar projects typically employ local unionized construction workers. Uh, thanks to the Federal Inflation Reduction Act and the 100% by 2040 bill, these projects require workers to be paid prevailing wage. Community solar projects and other smaller DG solar, in contrast, are not currently covered uh, by prevailing wage requirements. Uh, at the time the CSG program was created, there was very little solar on the grid in Minnesota, and the program was an opportunity to drive deployment, which it has done. However, much has changed since then. The PUC recently approved Xcel Energy's 480 megawatt Sherco solar project, and their recent IRP includes several gigawatts of new solar. As you all know, much of Minnesota operates under a regulated energy system. This means that our regulated utilities are required to go before the PUC to gain approval before they can build new projects. In doing so, they must demonstrate their projects are in the public interest, and they must show that they've acted prudently before they can recover project costs from ratepayers. Importantly, because of our regulated structure, all utility customers pay the costs and receive the benefits of energy resources. Uh, the CSG program doesn't operate this way. Individual subscribers, and the majority of those are commercial and industrial customers, along with garden owners, receive financial benefits which the ratepayers pay for. Unlike regulated utilities who have to get their rate of return approved by the PUC in a public process, there's very little transparency about the rate of returns for CSGs. Um, you, know, uh, you know, by tailoring the subscriber model to lower income individuals and, and specific non-residential users and bringing DERs under the PUC process, this bill takes an important step to ensuring that distributed solar is deployed in the public interest interest and with benefits for all ratepayers. The new prevailing wage requirements are important and will help ensure that smaller solar projects, all smaller solar projects, I should say, uh, also benefit workers. Uh, we appreciate Senator Frentz's thoughtful approach to the issue and we look forward to continuing to work with him and other stakeholders as the bill moves forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, Mr. Richardson. Thank you, Chair, committee members. My name is Reed Richardson. I'm the president of US Solar, a Minnesota-based solar developer active in XL Energy's community solar program since our founding in 2014. We are a turnkey developer and owner operator of community solar projects with thousands of residential subscribers, 100 plus community organizations like cities, schools, and other government agencies, and a provider of millions of dollars per year in valuable rent payments to farmer landowners. The amendment presented today creates opportunities for additional DG projects up to 10 megawatts, which is absolutely wonderful to see, and we applaud that. 
However, as it relates to the subscription aspects of community solar, it is concerning to see a proposal that will effectively eliminate the wonderful program we have in Minnesota. I'd like to address several items that have come up um, this year and in past years related to community solar. Number one is cost. As an earlier testifier uh, presented, phase one or early community solar applications in Minnesota provided bill credits at the applicable retail rate or ARR. In 2014, that rate was about 12 and a half cents and now it's 16 and a half cents and it continues to rise as it is tagged with the uh, retail rate. So as the rates go up, so does uh, the legacy cost of uh, phase one community solar. The current phase two program uh, is valued at the value of solar. This was a uh, the, the VOS. It was created during this or, uh, by the legislature and commerce to be a fair market uh, rate based on the value of solar generation, including avoided fuel generation, transmission, distribution, and environmental costs. The purpose of VOS was to provide cost neutrality and rate payer indifference. I think that has been mission accomplished. CSG applications today would receive a VOS rate of about nine and a half cents. I think it's nine six five, not thirteen and change that have been referenced uh, by Excel. The rate is set today and has a cost of living increase that is actually less than inflation. So we should look at the VOS rate today, not the VOS rate in twenty five years. Additionally, comparisons to utility scale solar of four to seven cents are misleading as they do not include the cost of transmission, which is uh, in some studies up to eight cents. Additionally, equity, both in terms of ownership allocation and in subscriber access. Um, U.S. Solar has committed to delivering over $130 million in electric bill savings to low to moderate income folks in other CSG markets. Here in Minnesota, with the artificial barrier of contiguous county, it's been difficult to access high volumes of residential or low income communities, so we applaud the removal of the continuous county uh, restriction. Additionally, uh, references have been made to uh, the ownership of the program, uh, specifically with Warren Buffett being the largest owner of CSGs in Minnesota. Well, I don't know if that's the case. I would like to point out that the three largest shareholders of XL are identical to the three largest shareholders of Berkshire Hathaway. I'm not sure what the logic is here. Um, I don't think we'd want to require all new, new utility infrastructure to be owned by Minnesota co-ops so no profits can go to uh, non-Minnesota-based investors. Um, additionally, uh, we deliver economic benefits to rural communities, farmer landowners, and subscribers, all while receiving less revenue than the value of solar rate. How do we do that? We, we, we compete for our subscribers and sell those value of solar credits at a discount, providing savings uh, without capital cost to our subscribers. In closing, allowing subscriber participation Opt-in participation is a key defining element of community solar, which empowers utility customers of all sizes to take personal action to reduce or eliminate the carbon footprint of their electricity use. Wisconsin, Michigan, Illinois, and dozens of other states are creating or expanding community solar. I don't think now, I don't think now is the time to roll back consumer choice and competition. U.S. Solar, our farmer landowners, their communities, hundreds of job seekers, and thousands of hopeful subscribers encourage continuation and expansion of this program. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Richard Richardson. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, next, we have a testifier uh, remotely, uh, Mr. Kevin Cray. Please state your name, and you may begin your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee, for the opportunity to speak today. And apologies, I was not able to be there in person. My name is Kevin Cray, and I'm a senior regional director for the Coalition for Community Solar Access, or CCSA. CCSA is a national trade organization solely focused on the community solar industry, representing over 115 members in virtually all community solar markets across the country and at the federal level. Our mission is to expand customer choice and access to the benefits of solar uh, for all Americans, regardless of their ability to host a solar array at their home business. I'd like to thank, thank Senator Frentz for his leadership on Senate File 2688 and overall support of the distributed solar industry in Minnesota. While the A1 amendment takes several key steps to update the community solar program and help bring it in alignment with national best practice, it leaves some major opportunities on the table. In particular, the going forward co program called for in this bill does not put Minnesota in a good position to secure its fair share of new federal tax incentives and grants under the IRA, which will be paid for by all Minnesotans regardless of the benefits that actually flow into the state. As codified in the state's new 100% clean energy goal, the electric system is going through a once in a generation transformation. To maintain a robust and successful community solar program is a critical element to ensure there are equitable opportunities for individual customers to directly participate in that transformation. As we've heard today, there are a growing number of stakeholders interested in making holistic reforms to modernize the community solar program with a greater focus on equity and access, but not unduly restrict it in the process. 
I look forward to working with Senator Prince, his staff, and other stakeholders to further refine the proposed changes to the community solar program to create a policy that is right for Minnesota and positions it well for long-term success. Thank you for your time. I welcome you. All right. Thank you. Uh, are there any more testifiers out there before we go on to uh, member questions? Going once, going twice. All right. First I have on the list is Senator Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, uh, Senator Friends, I will say I'm not a fan of solar gardens, okay? Didn't vote for them when they came up in the House. I still don't support them. I consider there a lot of concerns or corruption in the solar garden program. And for that, you taking a stab at trying to correct some of this abuse, I sincerely appreciate that. Uh, you know, I was on the Energy Committee in the House, and in there we had a XL Energy lobbyist, who I won't name, <laughs> make a presentation to us. And he said that in the solar gardens in Minnesota, 13% at that time, and this is a year or so old, were owned by people in the Minnesota or corporations. 67% of Minnesota solar gardens were owned by individuals and corporations outside the state of Minnesota. And as we heard testimony here, Warren Buffett owns a lot of our solar gardens, okay? And making money hand over fist. And 20% of our solar gardens are owned by foreign corporations and individuals. <laughs> and we're paying the higher rates to subsidize all this. I mean, it's really a transfer from the low income to the, to the, uh, to the wealthy is what it amounts to. So we got 87% of the solar gardens at that time were owned outside the state of Minnesota. You know, on line 4.28 and 4.29, I see that you put a uh, phrase in there, the solar garden is operated must maintain a physical address in Minnesota. Uh, uh, so basically you're trying to say, hey, you gotta have something here in Minnesota to own one of these solar gardens, and the way I interpret it. Now I hope the physical address is in a post office box, correct? Correct. Okay, um, so that they actually have to be here. So I appreciate you address the high cost, the, the uh, inequitable distribution of the cost and the distribution grid to a certain degree. Uh, the, the other thing, I had an amendment over in the House that time to reduce the rate, which was about four cents a kilowatt hour at that time, to the market rate, which is what the market rate was. Well, I heard some testimony, it doesn't include all the cost or whatever. But your efforts to reduce the cost on the Minnesota ratepayers, I sincerely appreciate, even though I don't support solar gardens, okay? At least you're taking a stab at it. The other concern I have, and I don't see it addressed in this bill, and I'd give you uh, just some thought to maybe we could address it next session, if not this session, is that one day these solar gardens are gonna have to be demolished, okay? And my concern is that a lot of these foreign and outstate people, and even Minnesota people, having corporations, once they made the money that they made, they're gonna declare bankruptcy for their co corporation when it's time to demolish these solar gardens. They're gonna lead, the rats are gonna lead the, the ship, okay? And Minnesota ratepayers are gonna have to pay for the cleanup of these solar gardens, which according to my local co-op, they're not gonna last as long as projected in, in terms of the people who uh, are in charge of it locally. So I don't see anything in your bill to address uh, the, the demolition cleanup eventually and the responsibility that the people who made money off this system have to pay for the cleanup versus Minnesota ratepayers. Correct me if I'm wrong, or is that addressed in your bill at all? Uh, Senator Grunhagen, so I'm taking, there's a couple of questions in there. To the demolition, Senator Friends. Sure, the cost of removing or replacing solar panels is built into the overall cost, Senator Grunhagen. There is nothing specifically in this bill about how we'll dispose of those panels, but I don't see a future of Minnesota without solar in it. So in the same way that we replace wind turbine blades, we'll be replacing solar panels, and I think the collective benefit to the state will be worth it in the same way as it is when we replace a car battery or replace a refrigerator. Senator Grunhagen. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that response, Sen uh, Senator Friends. You know, I will share this, and I was driving in the car, and this was a couple of years ago, when there was a solar engineer who uh, was talking about uh, solar panels, 
and their viability in the United States. And he's a solar engineer, and he had uh, put up quite a few of these. I wish I would have wrote his name down, but basically in his interview on the news, he just stated that any solar panel north of Oklahoma does not really viable. It doesn't re have a return on investment because of the angle of the sun and the, the variations of, of the seasons. So we're basically building things that are not going to be worth much down the road. And that is my concern. You don't have to respond to that if you don't want. It's just a statement I wanted to make. Right. Thank you. Uh, Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair, and thank you uh, to the chief author. I, I, you know, we're out of time. But what I was going to ask was several questions just regarding clarity on lines of the amendment uh, 2.26 through 2.31. And it really, I I'm just want to get clarity because I'm not familiar with the solar gardens. I don't fully understand what a subscriber looks like. So if I am a perspective, and again, I don't know if there's time to even answer this now, but I'll just throw it out there and maybe a future time. What does it look like? So I'm somebody interested on line 2.26. It says participation by a subscriber. What exactly does that mean? The next line down, it's, it speaks about a relationship then with a residential tenant and a landlord. What will that relationship look like in that capacity of a tenant in a residential property who wants to become a subscriber? And then uh, I see on line 2.31, allow subscribers to stop subscribing without a charge. That relates to line 2.26. So if I want to participate, I do know there's many other types of subscriptions like uh, internet or others where there is a, a fee up front or to disconnect that. And again, I don't know what this looks like. So is there a cost if I want to become a subscriber? Is there a contract length if I choose to, to terminate that early with a prohibition of on line 2.31 not to charge a penalty? Again, these, I'm just throwing all this out there at once here, and I don't know if there's even time to get into this, but thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Friends. Appreciate that, Mr. Chair, Senator Lucero. Those are the kinds of questions that I think there are people in this room that are more expert than me, but let me try to give you some basic feedback. So a subscriber is someone who says, I want to participate in solar. I'm willing to pay this much for it, and I agree to it for the uh, duration of the contract. We are um, looking at this partly because the original concept was that we would have a lot of residential and low-income subscribers, you know, help those uh, members of that, this, that economic strata to get more. It hasn't worked quite that way. And so the language you're talking about refers to someone who is an actual subscriber, refers to termination fee or the, the desire that we have to not have a big one. And I'd be happy to provide more to you offline. Again, I know we got some people in here who are way more versed in it than I am. But I think it's a totally fair question and glad to report that's one of the areas where these stakeholders have been cooking the last month um, to try to define who we want. Generally speaking, we want this to benefit more people that live in single family and multi-unit dwellings. And generally, we're a little concerned that more affluent corporations and other entities are getting more of the benefit than we would like. And so that part of it we're tweaking. That's as good as I can give you today. Thank you, Senator. Uh, next, Senator Rurick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, again, you know, I wasn't here when the community solar gardens were first put in place, but, you know, I think the intent was always that this was supposed to be for individuals who could not put it on their own properties, thus the willingness for there to be a higher rate. And so, um, and I know uh, there are developers out there who don't agree with that statement, but I believe from the folks I've talked to that were in the legislature, that was the actual intent. And it has gone astray from that. And so on uh, line 4.3 where you're saying at least 25% uh, must be residential customers, um, I believe that number should be higher. 50% uh, are, are greater in my opinion. Um, that is what the intent is. So I um, would love to have conversations with you um, about that. And then just one other uh, thing that I would, I'm kind of curious about how this online um, 4.26, uh, number six, how does that work with uh, a number two where we're saying uh, you no know fewer than three subscribers and that they um, no, can no, be no more than 40%. I mean, is that strictly to the 75% that's non-residential, uh, or, or how, how do those two go together? Senator Frentz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Rick. Just went past me. 
Um, we can have someone come up here, perhaps Mr. O'Grady, if you want to talk about that part of it more specifically, if that's if we have time for that. I realize we're running a little bit late, but happy to do that. Mr. O'Grady, as quickly as possible. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair and Senator Rarick, I might have to repeat the question, but to answer your earlier question, the intent of the community solar garden program was never specifically to be residential. We know this because if you look at the statutory intent of the language, it only requires a minimum of five subscribers to a garden, which means that five businesses who use a lot more energy could subscribe to the garden. As I mentioned earlier, there is a goal to reach more residents, and we're working on that, as Senator Friends mentioned. But as your second question, I might need you to repeat it. Uh, Senator Rarick, second question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So we have uh, number six as far as eligibility um, is saying that there can be no fewer than three subscribers and that none of them can have more than 40%. But what I'm, I'm trying to understand how that would jive with the requirement that 25 percent have to be um, residential subscribers or is that number six only to the say the 75 percent that would be non-residential subscribers. Senator Friends. Thank you Mr. Chair. Thank you Senator Eric. I demand we go to Mr. Stanley at this point. Mr. Chair members although these both have percentages in them I don't think there's actually a conflict between them. The language that you're asking about um, with respect to the 25% on, on line three of page four, that's saying that 25% has to be subscribed by residential customers who, who satisfy the income requirements. And it's also saying that no more on, on the, the second set of lines you're talking about, lines 26 and 27, it's saying that no individual subscriber can account for more than 40% of the, the capacity. And so, I think that you know you could the way that you could combine those things depends on how many people are subscribing, but you could have 25% meet the income threshold required at the top of page four, and still that does not in any way prohibit you from limiting any one subscriber to having no more than 40% of the subscribed capacity. Does that answer your question? All right, and with that, uh, we will. Move. We will renew Senator Friends's motion to lay over for possible inclusion. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Or the motion has been made. Thank you. Thank you. And we will be adjourned. Okay. So that was. Thank you. Did you continue? No, I meant adjourning in the committee.